Hello guys, Winston here. Earlier this year, when Carbide 3D was moving out of their old shop, I rescued a Shapeoko 3 that had been sitting in the office in complete disrepair. It was missing a control board, switches, hardware, it wasn't in great shape. So I brought it home with the idea of using it as an experimental platform I could mess around with without incurring downtime on my XL and also using this as my travel Shapeoko. Last year, when I'd set out on a cross-country road trip, my Nomad had been a delightfully portable companion, enabling a whole host of collabs along the way. But I also thought that the larger Shapeoko might be great in its own respects. Knowing that the Shapeoko's extrusions were somewhat absurdly over-designed, however, I started wondering if I could make the platform just a little flashier by dramatically lightening the rail structure. A lot of the inspiration for this crazy idea came from seeing rifles used in competition shooting that are often skeletonized to reduce weight. I sketched up a truss pattern that I figured would retain most of the vertical load-bearing capacity of the rails. This rail might have less torsional rigidity, but with the two ends fixed so closely together on the stock size Shapeoko, it really wasn't a big deal. When it came time to generate toolpaths for this truss structure though, I had a couple concerns. The biggest one was that I wasn't sure how easy it would be to machine through anodized aluminum. I know the anodized layer is just a small fraction of a millimeter thick, but I did read online that it can have a significant impact on tool life. I decided that I would machine the first step down with a sacrificial end mill and use my favorite single flute end mill to cut through the rest. But would I use an adaptive toolpath or a 2D contour? In my mind, there are three ways to go about this. The first is to just hog out the entirety of the cutout I wanted to create. I could probably do this in just one or two step downs using my aggressive high efficiency milling speeds and feeds, but that would mean having a larger surface area of anodized aluminum to punch through which wasn't appealing. I could also use an adaptive toolpath to just cut around the perimeter of my pocket. That would be much faster, but still slower than my least favorite toolpath, the 2D Contour. And considering I would have to machine three rails on two sides, the time savings of that 2D Contour simply could not be ignored. However, the benefit of what I call adaptive slotting is that the end mill is only ever touching one wall at any given time. Plus, each step down is much taller, so when the CNC gets close to liberating the little aluminum cookie in the middle of my pocket, there's very little risk of vibration, or the cutter getting pinched, or the piece getting caught by the cutter and thrown somewhere. If I used 2D contours, I would want to use tabs, and that's exactly what I did. I used triangular tabs here so that my end mill would never stop moving horizontally. Rectangular tabs have a retract and plunge phase, and these dwell points can cause small divots in the walls of your part. Usually, you can use stock to leave plus a finishing pass to ensure that these gouges aren't visible in your final part, but it's best to just not allow them to form to begin with. My plan was to manually cut through the tabs with a Dremel and then clean up the inner walls. A 3D contour with rest machining enabled would nibble away at the areas where my severed tabs were. Then I could run a spring pass along the walls to put the best surface finish possible on the rails. I overshot the bottom of the inner extrusion face by 15 thou to not only ensure I got everything, but to also use a less worn section of my end mill's cutting edge. And then it was time for the piece de resistance, the backside chamfer. Note that this is not a thread mill, it is a double angle cutter. This is programmed in as a chamfer mill and you can use it on the top side just like any other chamfer cutter. However, on the back side, because 2D toolpaths in Fusion are calculated based on the radius of the bottom edge of a tool, you'll need to use some math and geometric reasoning and adjust the stock to leave so that the tool is offset just right to hit the backside chamfer with the top edge of the double angle cutter. Or you can just do what I did and use some good old fashioned trial and error. Nothing too groundbreaking here in terms of cam, though I am trying some new techniques. Let's go see if they work. In setting up my Shapeoko to machine this piece of a Shapeoko, I first aligned the rail against a groove in my wasteboard that I'd accidentally cut in a previous project. That conveniently provides me a reference I know is parallel to the x-axis. I'll clamp the two ends down and then add some more clamps to use as a hard stop. Now, looking at this setup, I initially wondered if this would be secure enough. Part of me wanted to steal a bunch of low-profile vices from work and clamp the rail at multiple points between the ends, because what if there was some vibration induced by the cutting forces and, oh wait, all of the Shapeoko's rails are secured at only two ends and they are subjected to the exact same forces in equal magnitude in opposite directions. Don't overthink it, clamp it at two ends and just go for it. To set my origin, I used a sheet of paper and the shank of my end mill to find the edges of my workpiece. I zeroed off on one end, found the opposite edge, and set my zero to the distance traveled divided by two. Then I loaded up the first program, hit start, and crossed my fingers. I was pleasantly surprised when my initial 15 thou depth of cut contouring toolpath with a sacrificial three flute end mill cut through the anodized layer without any protest. 
Switching to the 278Z, I began slotting around my cutouts. Towards the end, when I was cutting through the back edge of my triangular tabs, things got a little noisy, so I adjusted the toolpath. It turns out that the descent after a triangular tab uses the plunge feed rate, not ramping feed rate. I usually set my plunge feed rate pretty fast, assuming that the actual entry moves into your stock would use either lead-in or ramping feed rates. That is not the case with tabs, so I reduced the plunge feed rate for this toolpath. After my initial cutout, I came in with a Dremel to remove the tabbed pieces of stock in the middle. Then the cleanup toolpath was run. And then after that, the chamfering toolpaths. I was looking for a really subtle chamfer, more of an edge break than anything. If I cut the chamfer too wide, the texture difference between the anodized and raw aluminum would be very obvious when you looked at the rails from head on. I wanted a crisp but not finger-cuttingly sharp line of demarcation between the anodized face and my cut edges. I machined all three rails on their front face and made a new setup for the back side. Because of the V-edges on the front side of these rails, my Y-axis zero point was shifted and would need to be remeasured. Then it was just a matter of rerunning the exact same tool pads with one exception. The center rail on the stock shape OCO3 has two holes for mounting the controller board. I would need to keep material around these holes, otherwise I wouldn't be able to attach my carbide motion board. The cutout pattern here is just a little different than on the front. And then, once it was completed, it was just a matter of rebuilding Samwise the Shape Oko. I would say better than before, but by every objective measure except for maybe speed, a lighter CNC is a worse CNC. It's not as strong, it doesn't dampen vibration as well, but I think the end result looks a hell of a lot cooler, and that is really all that matters here. This is going to be a light duty, travel capable CNC that's over 600 grams lighter per rail, and I can easily immobilize the gantry with a zip tie or paracord or shoelaces. So, skeletonized shape Oko 3 that has nothing to do with Halloween, aka Skeloko? Let me know what you think. Do you love it or hate it? Drop a comment down below. Either way, I'm quite fond of this machine, and you can't have it unless you make your own. This is an entirely unofficial mod, so don't hold your breath for Carbide 3D to sell any of these. I want to thank you all very much for watching, and I'll be back soon with more CNC projects and DIY nonsense.